I am a child of the drug war. 41 years ago, Richard Dixon declared a war on drugs, calling it public enemy number one. It was 1971 and 3.5 million children were born in our country that year. My older brother was one of them. He was born only a few days before this public declaration. Another 26 million children would be born during the 1970s, myself and my younger brother included. In fact, I just turned 37 years old two days ago and my brother turning 34 yesterday. Now, of all the children that were born during that decade, I really believe there, we were the first children, the first adults to have experienced this this villain, this super villain that Nixon created and every single president since him has failed to stop. We are children of the drug war. But we're also children who grew up on sci-fi and comic books. But unfortunately, those superheroes we transformed ourselves into and the superpowers that we insisted we had would be the same superpowers that we would have to evoke as adults to try to end and stop public enemy number one. So I have to admit, I love to dress up, and uh, oftentimes as a superhero. And I blame it on the fact that I was born the day after Halloween, and I imagined I came into this world, and the doctors and the nurses around me were in costume. And they have inspired my love of dress up ever since. So as a child of the drug war by day, and Wonder Woman by night, I have made a commitment to focus my work, my rage, my passion, and my superpowers on trying to transform our punitive and heavily moralistic approach to drugs from that of a criminal issue to a health issue. Like every war, this war has produced painful consequences. It's left a trail of pain and death and destruction in its path. So as children of the, of the drug war, we regularly tuned in to episodes of Bionic Man and The Incredible Hulk. But little did we know that one in 31 of us would end up under the watch of the criminal justice system. We wouldn't end up being those superheroes we imagined we could be, but instead delegated to a growing undercast of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated. In 1970, there were fewer than 200,000 people incarcerated in our prisons, that number is 1.5 million today. <clears throat> and if we were to add in our local jails, it's as high as 2.3 million. So we have to ask, what has fueled the incarceration of our people? <clears throat> and we really do have to look at drug arrests. Drug arrests have more than tripled in the last 25 years. And if we were a young African-American boy growing up in the 70s, one in nine of us would be behind bars on probation or on parole. Today, there are more black men incarcerated and under the watch of the criminal justice system than there were enslaved in 1850. African Americans are more likely to be arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated than other Americans for the very same drug law violations. So as we sauntered into junior high, remember the Dorothy Hamill haircuts, wearing our members only jackets and those leg warmers? We'd be the first subjects of the infamous dare, just say no, and scared straight programs. But you know, we'd learned that these programs did nothing, did little to deter us from using drugs. In fact, all they did was break that delicate balance of trust that should have been established with those educators. Those educators should have realized that some of us would experiment, and unfortunately, sometimes that experimentation would get out of control. So instead of scaring us with lies, they should have been giving us information to keep us safe. And I remember my older brother coming home from junior high one day, and he told us that he learned in, in school that if boys smoked marijuana, they'd grow breasts and girls' beards. I mean, we were perplexed. <laughs> we had grown up in a community where we knew adults who occasionally and responsibly used marijuana they had completely broken our trust. And in 2001, the Surgeon General placed DARE in a category of ineffective programs. So as we debated whether Mikey, remember Mikey, the famed kid from the cereal commercials, really died from eating Pop Rocks and drinking Coke? <laughs> Little did we know that every year, 
37,000 of us will die of drug overdoses. Today, we're more likely to die of a drug overdose than in a traffic accident. And for those of us who unfortunately ended up struggling with addiction, the only bed we were likely to see is that in a jail cell and, and not in treatment. So in 1985, I was 10 years old, and I was disappointed to learn that those helicopters buzzing overhead summer after summer were not the superheroes coming to save me from Captain Bad Example who ran with scissors. They were in fact a counter drug unit funded by the federal government who claimed that my mother's tomato plants were marijuana plants. At the time, I was 10, I didn't know that we would spend billions and billions of dollars every year incarcerating people for tiny, tiny amounts of drugs. The same people who would be denied the right to vote, access to good housing, food stamps, and good paying jobs. So sadly, as adults, if we don't act, our children will become children of the drug war. As adults, it's time to admit that this war on drugs has failed. It's failed globally, it's failed in our country, and it's failed right here in our neighborhoods. So we ask, how can we end Nixon's failed drug war? And I'd like to propose that we end it by resurrecting the superpowers of truth, <laughs> compassion, common sense, and science. So let me introduce to you a group of superheroes I think embody the superpowers to end this war. So first of all, there's Narcan Man. And Narcan Man can reverse an overdose in a single dose. He knows there's a scientifically proven way to reverse an overdose caused by heroin or opiate-based pills. In fact, he knows it only costs $20 to save a life. And that medical personnel aren't the only ones who can administer Narcan. In fact, our friends and family can be trained to save a life. Then there's La Linda, and La Linda spreads the truth about decriminalizing drug use she learned from the Portugal experience. In 2001, Portugal was faced with a heroin ep epidemic that they didn't know what to do with. And so they made a decision to decriminalize drug use. So instead of treating people, drug users, as as criminals, they now divert people into treatment. And 10 years later, what we've learned is that intravenous drug use has been reduced by 50%. Drug-related HIV rates are on the decline. And Portugal now has the lowest drug use rate in the European continent. Then there's the Green Reefer. The Green Reefer knows that today, 50% of Americans support legalizing marijuana. He believes in treating marijuana like we do alcohol, by creating a legal regulatory market for the production and manufacturing of marijuana. He also believes in upholding medical marijuana laws that allow sick patients to have their medicine to relieve their pain and suffering. And finally, there's Mr. Safety First. And Mr. Safety First, protects our youth. Now, he encourages young people to stay away from drugs, but he knows no matter what the adults in these, these kids' lives say or do, they may still use drugs. And so they, he provides honest, based education for these young people so they can make informed decisions, and he gives them information on how to stay safe. So these are the, the superheroes I believe can end this war on drugs. So I ask you all to join me by day and by night. Find the superhero in all of you. Let's make the drug war an election issue. We will not see change unless there is growing pressure from voters like you. And so I think finally we should be guided to action by a famous superhero's wisdom. Wonder Woman asks, what sort of world do you all want to live in? So I ask you, Join me.